but the point is, is that we may not always understand in our own personal situations or in the situations of people that we deal with, um, you know, how God is working or, you know, uh, what his purposes are, but we can cling to the reality that God does have some all wise and good purpose for the evil and the suffering that we go through, especially as believers. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. And what I seek to do is to equip you to live with biblical clarity in our confusing world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. You know, the chaos and confusion of our world so often comes from the the problems in life of suffering and malevolence, or as we call it sometimes tragedy and evil. We live in a world that is obviously broken. We, we uh, all, all people, regardless of culture, time and place that they live, even uh, religious beliefs, we all as human beings lament the fact of life that there is so much suffering in it. And we lament that there is so much uh, evil and, and human malevolence in our world. And we all ask why. It's an issue that every single worldview has to answer. And today's on today's episode, I have a guest who has written an excellent book that tries to uh, put forward a, a Christian, uh, biblically grounded, God-centered answer to this question of the problem of evil. His name is Scott Christensen, and he his new book that we got to talk about today on the podcast is called What About Evil? Scott Christensen holds an MDiv from the Master Seminary and is the author of What About Free Will? And as we talked about today, What About Evil? He worked for nine years at the award-winning CCY Architects in Aspen, Colorado, where several of his home designs were featured in Architectural Digest magazine. Called out of this work to the ministry, he graduated with honors from seminary and now serves as the associate pastor of Kerrville Bible Church in Kerrville, Texas. I really enjoyed this conversation that I got to have with Scott. I think that you're going to enjoy it too. Quickly, before we get into the conversation, let me just remind you, uh, if you are not subscribed to Filter yet, to subscribe to this podcast on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, you like to watch videos, it's, we're on YouTube, uh, or you can subscribe on uh, on your favorite podcast platform. We're on all pa- podcast platforms, whether it is Apple, Spotify, Google, uh, Anchor, or, or so on, you can find Filter and subscribe there so that you can get notifications and get all future episodes automatically in your podcast or YouTube uh, homepage. Also, if you enjoy this video, you could really help us out uh, by sharing it with somebody that you know, somebody that you think would get a lot out of it too. Share it with them. If you would also leave us a rating and review, that really helps us out a lot to get the word out to more people who can benefit from this message of biblical clarity in our confusing world. Well, without any further delay, uh, let's jump into this great conversation that I got to have with Scott Christensen. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here. Yeah, well, I'm really happy that you're here, that you took the time to join us today on Filter. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation, uh, getting to talk to you. I've been, uh, I've been following you on social media and uh, interested in your book for a while now. Uh, it's on one of my favorite topics, which is uh, apologetics and you know, a, a theological, philosophical uh, dealing with the problem of evil, suffering in the world, uh, theodicy, and so on, all those things that we're going to get into. Um, and so, and so it's, I've been excited to have this conversation with you today. So thanks for joining us. Yes, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So uh, let's start off by talking about uh, what led to this book. You know, what, what is it that, that, that uh, interested you in the subject and led to you writing this book? What about evil? Yeah, well, I, I never really wanted to write this book, um, but uh, I, I wrote I wrote my previous book was called What About Free Will? Mm-hmm. And um, 
And of course, questions about free will always intersect questions of, about the problem of evil uh, because they, they, you know, they intersect issues of human responsibility, moral culpability, and, and, you know, divine culpability for evil. And so, so all those questions get intertwined. And, uh, and, and so when I wrote the, the free will book, um, I, I had a uh, couple of sections in that book dealing with the problem of evil um, in a cursory kind of way. I didn't go into great depth in it. But, um, but my editor at my publisher really liked what I had to say in the free will book. And so he had suggested that I write a whole book on the problem of evil. And I said, no, I do not want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to wade into, well, that's the, a challenge. into the thorny uh, yeah. issues involved there, um, mm-hmm. especially as a new writer and, and uh, you know, and whatnot. But um, so anyway, I really wanted to write a book on repentance and uh, but but he said, well, do both. <laughs> and, uh, but I knew he really wanted me to write this book. And the more I thought about it, the more I saw the great need for it, especially considering that most treatments of the problem come from a decidedly Arminian or free will theist position. It's pretty much the standard response to the problem of evil among theologians and Christian uh, apologists and whatnot. And uh, there's not that many full-length Calvinist reformed types of treatments of the topic, and um, and so uh, so I felt like it was not being adequately addressed. And the other issue to me was, you know, just looking at broader theological questions and the whole the whole narrative of Scripture to me seemed integral to the question of, of how do we address the problem of evil? And, uh, and, and most, most treatments of the problem of evil get, get kind of bogged down in some of the philosophical questions. And, um, you know, and, and they don't really look at the big picture. And so I really wanted to step back and look at the big picture of what is God doing in the world? Mm-hmm. And, and obviously evil is very pervasive in the world and if god is truly sovereign there's got to be a reason for that what what's going on and so that was really at the heart of of what i wanted to deal with and uh and so even though i deal with a lot of the typical questions that arise when dealing with the problem evil i really wanted to get to the heart of of a theodicy that i thought was biblically rooted yeah, that's great, and I and I think that's important for us to do as Christians that we that we understand and uh, and view the problem of evil through the lens of Scripture and not just through the lens of a uh, a philosophy divided from or or, or 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 too separated from the light of God's Word. Um, and so that you know, we really we 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 see it through, and even the the philosophical issues we analyze through the lens of of God's word and wisdom to us. Um, you know, we, we've already thrown around a, a lot of terms that might be new for uh, some of our listeners uh, and, and, and really just the whole problem that we are, that we, we keep bringing up uh, as a problem in the way that we're talking about it might, might be new to a lot of people. So tell us what is the problem that you're trying to address in this book? Well, um, the problem of evil, as it is often called, is is ages long problem. It really goes back to the garden if you think about it. Um, but but it's always been raised uh, throughout history. Uh, Greek philosophers raised this question um, even before the advent of Christianity and 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 um, you know before Christ and so forth. Um, but basically, it can be boiled down to what is called a, 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 the, a, the trilemma, which is that if you have an all-powerful God who is also all good, right, uh, omnipotent and omnibenevolent, uh, and you have those two conditions that mark the God of the Bible, of Christianity, 
and yet there is evil in the world. Why is that? In other words, why would a good, an all good God allow evil in the world and an all powerful God? So, so the presence of evil seems to place in question either God's power or God's goodness. So if, if God is all good, and there's evil in the world, then it seems that perhaps he's not powerful enough to prevent it or stop it from happening. Or conversely, if he's all powerful and has permitted evil um, to take place in the world, then perhaps he's not all good. Uh, because certainly in the assumption, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, a glaring assumption there that God does not want evil in the world. And so that's kind of the starting place. And so the question is, why has God allowed evil in the world? And how do we, how do we defend the character of God? And that's really, that's really what the problem kind of boils down to. How can we defend as Christians a God who would either permit or even more strongly actually ordain evil to exist in this world? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and still retain his his sovereignty and his goodness. So that that's the basic issue, and and of course it's plagued Christians and non Christians alike for for centuries, uh, for millennia, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so and it's often called the Achilles' heel of of Christian apologetics because it's the most uh, it's the most common objection to Christianity. And, um, and so Christians really do have a burden to, to address this, this question, not just for the unbeliever and the skeptic, but for themselves, because it, it can be a source of great uh, discouragement to the believer. It can, you know, when you experience personal suffering yourself, those questions of why God uh, are, are obviously pervasive in our lives. And, uh, and at some point, we, we beg for questions, beg for answers to the questions that, 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 that it raises. Mm -hmm. And so what is unique about your approach to, to this problem and your approach in the book, What About Evil? Well, what is interesting, I think, about my approach is um, in, in recent years, it, it has not been very... Um, popular to offer a positive reason for why God either permits or ordains evil in the world. And this is really technically known as a theodicy. Um, and, and there's some technical terms there because you have this word theodicy, which comes from the Greek word theos and dike for, for, for justify. And the idea is, how do you justify God in the face of evil? That's, that's literally what a theodicy means. Mm -hmm. However, it's taken on a more technical kind of uh, meaning, which is explaining why God has allowed evil. Yeah. Okay, now this is in distinction to what is known as a defense, right? Um, and, and a defense is just simply defending God against charges that he is culpable for evil. So some philosophers and theologians don't want to wade into the thicket of actually answering the question, well, why God, why have you purposed evil? Rather, they, they want to just stop at defending God. Okay, we know evil exists. We're not sure why evil exists, but we just want to make sure that you know that God's not responsible for it or he's not morally culpable for it. Yeah. And so that's a defense. If you're just simply defending God against the charges that he's not God, that he's not wholly righteous, wholly good, and yet at the same time, all powerful, um, you know, that that's where many Christian theologians and apologists stop. Mm -hmm. So I actually go a step further. I, I try to deal with some of those questions, and they're important questions, but they still don't get to the heart of, I think, the deepest questions that people have is that, yeah, I understand that, that we can defend God against charges that he is morally culpable for evil, mm 
but it still doesn't ask the question, why? Why is there evil in the world? And so a true theodicy then uh, tries to give a, a, a reasonable answer to that question. Mm. Yeah. And so that's what I try to do in, in my book. Yeah, excellent. And, and that is no easy task. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> So, so in attempting to give an answer, a positive answer, a give a theodicy as you defined, uh, where do you start? Well, I, I think you have to start first of all with who God is. Um, I don't think you can even get to the question of, of evil until you understand who God is and what it is that he is doing in the world. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I think, you know, we have a tendency to, to, to domesticate God uh, to our liking, and we have a tendency to look at our own personal concerns or human agendas, if you will, as a way of framing the problem of evil. In other words, we have this tendency to think that, that and there's the assumption that that if God is good, then he's concerned for our human happiness. And if he's concerned for our human happiness and evil intrudes upon that human happiness, well, then surely God doesn't want to do that. And so we have a tendency to frame the whole problem as though God is God's deepest concern is human happiness Mm -hmm. and uh and you know and so so we malign god when he doesn't meet those expectations of of achieving whatever we think human happiness should should mean for us and it's interesting how many people even christians frame the problem in that in that regard even c.s lewis kind of framed it that way says you know the creatures are not happy you know so what must god do to make them happy (laughs) and and i think it's a very wrong-headed approach uh to dealing with the problem because it's not about us ultimately if we understand who god is it's about god everything is ultimately about the transcendent lord of the universe and so i begin by looking at who is God uh, in terms of his transcendent reality Mm -hmm. and, um, and the fact that, that why did he create the world? We didn't have any need to create the world. Uh, It wasn't as though he was lonely. He had the benefit of, of perfect Trinitarian inner Trinitarian love for all eternity so it wasn't as if he was, you know, needed to create at all. So why did he create? Well, I believe the consistent answer of Scripture and and the history of theology has been that God created to magnify His glory to His creatures, and uh, and so I start with that in terms of offering a theodicy. and uh, and so I say, well, how I ask the question how is God's glory most magnified? Um, And when we just stop as Christians and think about it, there's only one place we can go to answer the question, where has God been most magnified in history? And it is in the death and resurrection, the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, that is the central event of history. Um, it, it was not an accident. God planned it that way. But what is the whole purpose of the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ? Well, it's to redeem a fallen world. Um, the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ would be a necessary as a, as a means by which God brings about redemption in a fallen world, unless that world had fallen in the first place. And so I argue that the reason why 
evil exists in this world is because God has chosen to magnify his glory supremely, and he's done so only one way, and that is through the redemption of that world and the redemption of, of a, a people for himself that he has redeemed through the work of Jesus Christ. Mm. And so it's really a fairly simple answer to the problem although it has profound implications. Um, but it, to me, it helps frame the whole narrative of Scripture and, and what God is doing in history. Um, and, and that the presence of evil cries out for some kind of redress. It cries out for redemption. And that's precisely what God has done, I believe. Uh, in, in creating conditions in the world where the fall of Adam and Eve would take place, uh, where, you know, the arch villain Satan would enter into the scene and wreak all kinds of havoc. So that it would create conditions for the only one who is capable of redeeming such a corrupted world mm. uh, in, in the person of Christ, the second person of the Trinity who took on human flesh um, died and rose again uh, as, as an atoning sacrifice to purchase for God a people that he would redeem for his own glory, and then to reverse the whole curse that came upon the creation as a result of Adam and Eve's sin and, uh, and, and the full consummation of the kingdom of God that will take place in, ultimately in the new heavens and the new earth. Yeah. And, um, and, and so the narrative scripture is the theodicy of the Bible, I believe. Mm, yeah. And it's the whole storyline of redemption. And, and I believe it's, it's beautiful and it's powerful. And, and what I suggest in my book is that we would never have a sense of the greatness of God's glory and the supreme manner in which he magnified it, unless he had purposed evil to be in this world, because we could not see the glories of redemption without it. It would be unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I basically say, you know, the storyline of scripture is not a flat, it's not a flat line, right? Um, there's a massive crisis that, that thrusts the world into the depths of, of depravity and despair and misery and suffering and pain and all of that. And then the glory is seen when Christ uh, uh, dives into the very heart of that pain and suffering and through his own death defeats death, through his own death defeats evil and, and demonstrates his power over it through his resurrection and eventual uh, consummation as a Lord of, of, of the universe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's a pow it's a story of the powerful hero of the great and, and awesome protagonist. Uh, and, and so that when we look at the person of Christ and we look at what he did, there's no greater way that God could magnify his glory than through that kind of a story. Yeah. Yeah, so since God is sovereign and since he desires above all else to magnify his glory, he allows evil in the world. And so it's by starting with this right foundation about who God is that we then can make sense of the presence of evil and suffering in the world and in a way that uh, is truly grounded in what scripture presents to us, right? And not just philosophy separated from the light of God's word. I, one exactly. thing I'm hearing... Yeah, one yeah. thing I'm hearing is, is, is a theme that I think is uh, very present and has implications for all of Christian apologetics, which is that so often uh, defending the faith is really just about telling people who God actually is. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, I recently had Andy Bannister on the podcast, and he's, uh, he's an apologist who, who works with, uh, fo he focuses mainly on working with atheism and then Islam. And in both cases, he, he brought this up as well, how, how so often whenever he's talking to somebody and they'll tell him, uh, I don't believe in God, for example, he'll say, well, tell me who you don't believe in. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes. and then, 
and then say, well, actually, I don't believe in that either. And, and here's the things that I do believe. And, and the same is, is so true when it comes to dealing with the problem of evil is that we've got to start with, uh, well, 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 tell me about the kind of God that you don't believe in because of evil. And then let me tell you about who the Bible actually presents to us, right? Because um, yes. it, it makes such profound differences. Yes. Um, what's the difference or, or is there a difference between the argument that you're making and the greater good argument? Um, yeah, so the, the greater good argument, which for, for your listeners, we should probably explain, mm-hmm. explain what that is. Please There's do. different <laughs> approaches to, to the problem of evil. And, and one that I think has great promise is called the greater good theodicy or the greater good defense. Mm-hmm. And the idea is simply this, that God purposes or ordains evil uh, so that he would bring about a greater good from that evil that otherwise could not occur unless the evils connected to those goods had had precipitated them, if you will. So, for example, you could say courage is a great virtue, but how does one develop the good, the, 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 the good of courage unless you have some crisis that you must face and overcome with courage, Mm -hmm. right? Which usually implies some kind of evil connected to it, whether it be natural evil, for example, in, you know, the unfortunate, uh, from our perspective, unfortunate occurrences that are the result of living in a, in a fallen world or whether they're result of, of, of facing up against moral evil. Right. Uh, So, um, you know, you have all all the great heroes of all the great stories we ever love to read about or movies we love to watch are about some hero that overcomes some moral crisis or some natural evil mm-hmm. uh, and, and faces it with great courage. And, and so, but courage would be nothing. We, we wouldn't even know about courage uh, unless there was some evil that, that you know, that required courage uh, you know, to overcome it. And, and, and so, so it's a good, a great, the greater good argument is that evil becomes necessary to these greater goods. Uh, um, and, and so the idea is that, that um, yes, there could be good without evil, but there are certain goods that we could never get unless there was the presence of evil. Mm-hmm. And so that's the greater good argument real basically um and so my theodicy is really a variation or a subspecies if you will of the great of the broader greater good argument it's a form of a greater good argument i call it the greater glory theodicy because it's specifically focused on the notion that that a theodicy is that which by which god is most glorified and so it's less of a focus on the greater goods. There's still those greater goods, especially for us, for the redeemed. Um, but the real focus isn't upon the goods that we receive uh, in the face of evil. It's really the glory that God receives. And it is through his glory that we receive those goods. Um, so his glory becomes primary and the goods that accrue to us as those who are redeemed are secondary. And, and it also helps us understand another question, which is, you know, not all people are redeemed, right? So how is there any greater good for, um, for those who are condemned eternally to hell? Uh, and that's a big, that's an important question that Christians need to answer. And, and so, again, this dismisses this notion that God created us specifically to achieve happiness on our part, right? Because not everybody gets the happy ending. Only the redeemed get the happy ending. And so we have to grapple with the fact that, that it's not ultimately about our happiness. It's ultimately about God's glory. And God is glorified as much in judgment as he is in the display of his mercy. 
though I believe his greater glory is connected to his mercy and not his judgment. Um, nonetheless, it's all about God's glory in the mm-hmm. end. And it's not, otherwise, I think we would have to maintain a form of universalism, yeah. you know, that ultimately all will be redeemed, but we know that's not what the Bible tells us. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And I love that. And I, I think it's one of the things that attracted me to your, to interest in your book whenever I first came across it. I, I almost think of your argument as, um, like you said, like you said, a subset or species of the greater good, where if you think of the, the greater good argument as like an arrowhead and what you're arguing is the tip and it's the, it, and so it's the, it's the piece of it that without, that without it, the rest of the arrowhead would be pretty ineffective. It wouldn't really be able to work if you didn't have that piercing tip. Yes. Because yeah. I think, I think that's one of, I think that's, I've always been very attracted to um, and, and appreciated the greater good argument the most out of any theodicies or, or defenses regarding, um, regarding evil. Um, most especially from Christian theologians, but, but even from people like Viktor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, where he argues this logocentric way of viewing life and especially suffering where, you know, you don't endure or make it through suffering by just trying to uh, pursue happiness or pleasure or whatever else, but through believing that there's a purpose in it. Right. And that's really powerful. And there's been a lot of people out there who have gained a lot from it. But if you don't have a God who is there, who makes objective reality itself meaningful, you know, then, yes. then you, you can't even follow Frankel's advice without some, at some point ending up in nihilism and giving it up. Because how can you endure suffering, believing that there's a meaning and purpose, if you can't even know for a fact that life or objective reality itself has meaning, but God grounds that. And I think, and, I, and so that's, what I, that's where I see your argument as coming in and really filling in that piece that can then make the rest of the greater good defenses yes. and so on uh, a lot more solid and, and be held together in something that you can, you can truly uh, trust in, um, as well as, as prioritize it. Because I think sometimes the greater good argument can start to become a little person-centric. Yes. rather than God-centric, which is what your greater glory argument does. Yes, yes. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, it's decidedly trying to frame all the questions about evil and theodicy in a very God-centered manner, which, um, you know, which is how we should approach all of life and all of theology, every mm-hmm. aspect of of how we think about reality, as you say, needs to be center back on once again who is god and what is he doing in the world yeah and uh and and so um so so yeah when we start there and we keep our focus on the person of christ and what he has done as a reflection of the god uh that he is in the trinitarian nature of God's existence um, completely frames how we think about everything. And and so theology proper is so, so critical, which is why most systematic theology start there (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's how we frame the way we think about, about everything else. Yeah. So this might be opening a can of worms, but we've, both talked a little a few times now about uh and, and you've said several times uh god purposing or ordaining evil right and so listeners might be by hearing this for a lot of them this being new and and you know starting to real realize the implications of what you're saying and and asking themselves wait is he saying that god is sovereign over evil and actually in control of evil I think that's a new topic, or, 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 or I'm sorry, a new thought for a lot of people. So can you answer that question? Is God sovereign over evil? Y- yes, absolutely. Because if, if 
if God is not sovereign over evil, if he does not have control, full control over what occurs and what doesn't occur, then you have to say, well, then where does evil come from ultimately? And I'm not saying that that means God is the immediate cause of evil. And these are some of the questions that I deal with uh, Mm -hmm. in in the book. Um, Nonetheless, God has providentially ensured that all evil that occurs in the world does take place. And so we have to grapple with that question. Um, And uh, if God is not in control, then something else is. What is it? Mm. Um, You know, and and then you end up with some kind of a dualistic uh, uh, worldview where you're pitting good and evil against one another. And they're in this perpetual battle. Uh, and hopefully good in the end will win. Well, uh, that's, that's a misframing of reality. The fact is, is God is sovereign over good and evil. And uh, I, I think an important place in, in scripture to, to make that argument is really in, in the book of Isaiah. Um, I think it's worth l- looking at a, at a couple of interesting passages that I deal with at length in my book. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is in Isaiah 46, um, and uh, um, God is speaking. He says, remember, this is Isaiah 46, 9. He says, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. And it's interesting that he's framing what he's about to say Uh, from the position of God's uniqueness as the transcendent God of all, really. Uh, That's what he's saying. He is saying, I am uniquely transcendent. You can't compare me to anything else. You can't even think uh, in in categories uh, of, you know, you can't place me in any category. I am so unique um, that, that I stand in a category all by myself. Uh, And and so he frames everything he's getting ready to say with this amazing transcendent view of him, of himself as he reveals himself to us. So he goes on to say, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east and the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly, I've spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. And, and so the idea is that God has declared everything. He's declared everything from beginning to end, and he will establish his purpose. And I think it's an all-encompassing kind of, of, of statement um, of, of his sovereign control over, over everything. And then if you jump back to Isaiah 45, um, he, he says uh, he says a similar thing in, in verse 5. He says, says, I am the Lord and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising, of the, the rising to the setting of the sun that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. The one forming light and creating darkness. Now, that's very interesting because the word forming there is the word bara, which is usually translated create. And it's a a Hebrew term that is only used of God. He is the only subject of that verb Mm. uh, to create. He says the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. And he uses that word word again bara and there it is translated create in this version uh but the word calamity is the standard hebrew word for evil and uh he says i am the lord who does all these it's an astounding statement because it's saying that god is god has purposed this um now the manner in which he uh, ensures that evil takes place is is ultimately a mystery because we know from James, for example, that God does not tempt anyone. He can't be tempted by evil. And so he does not tempt anyone else to evil. Um, And yet, you know, you know, we read things in in Exodus that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. Uh, 
even as Pharaoh himself hardened his own heart. Um, and so there's, there's culpability as assigned to Pharaoh and no culpability assigned to God. And yet somehow he ensures that Pharaoh's heart is hardened mm. and how he does that without himself infusing evil in the heart of Pharaoh. Mm. There's some mystery there for sure. Yeah. And, and, and I don't think the scripture will give us mechanics of how God ensures these things take place. However, this is what's important. And this goes back to the greater good argument. Um, God would never ensure that any evil takes place in this world, that he does not have some greater good for its, its occurring. Yeah. And, and I think the best place where that is answered is, is in Genesis uh, with the story of Joseph and his brothers in which, um, you know, his brother sold him into slavery and uh, he ends up in Egypt and eventually ends up becoming the prime minister, as it were, of, of Egypt. And his brothers have this meeting with him and they're trembling in their boots and they recognize their own culpability. And they're afraid that now he's got the power to ensure their, their deaths, if you will. Mm -hmm. And they admit their own moral culpability of having sold him into slavery. But what's interesting in Isaiah, or excuse me, in Genesis 46 Joseph says, it wasn't you that sent me here, but God sent me here. In other words, it wasn't ultimately you that decided that I was going to be sold into slavery. Yes, you did. And from your perspective, you were culpable and, and, and you really are culpable for this action. Uh, but the reality is this, that God intended it to happen all along. And then he he frames all of that in Genesis 50, 20, when he says what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And so that is a, a remarkable verse because it shows that what humans meant in the same event for evil, God in his transcendent, mysterious providence and benevolence and goodness can mean that same event for some good mm -hmm. so that God always has some good purpose for the occurrence of evil. Now we may not know what that is yeah. and God is not obligated in any way to reveal all the reasons why any particular occurrence of evil may occur. Um, but we do have, we do have to know that he would not, and he would not ordain any evil to occur unless he had some supremely good and wise reason for it to occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the places in scripture that I always go to is on, on this question or issue is those two verses in, uh, in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four, uh, slightly, in slightly different context, but each of them say something very similar, which is essentially that, uh, that God had ordained the, or he, he had planned for new the crucifixion of Christ. And it was, but it was carried out by the hands of lawless men is the way that yes. Peter says it in, in Acts chapter two. Yes. Uh, in one sense, you could look at and say, what is the most evil thing that has ever occurred in the history of the world? Uh, you know, we think of things like the Holocaust and, you know, the, the, deaths of millions and millions of, uh, of people at the hands of dictators like, you know, uh, Mao and, and Stalin and people like that. But the reality is, is that the most evil event in the history of the world is the death of the most innocent man in, in, in the world, which is mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, and so, yeah, Peter in his sermon in Acts 2 says, Men of Israel, uh, to these words, uh, Jesus and Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. In other words, they knew exactly who he was, who he claimed to be. So they were not, they were that without excuse in terms of the identity of Christ. They were fully aware of who he claimed to be and that he demonstrated his identity as the Messiah, as the God man mm -hmm. through what he did. He says, this man delivered 
over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, mm. you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, right? And put him to death. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, you have side by side a, a man who these people fully knew who he was. They were godless and they put him to death. And yet all of that was the result of the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Mm -hmm. And a similar, yeah, similar passage in, in Acts 4 where the church is praying and, and, and they say essentially the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, pretty incredible. I, I remember the, the very first time that I, that I read those words in the, in the context of these questions and how they just, they, they bring so much clarity and then yet almost so much confusion at the same time. <laughs> you know? yeah. Clarity in that, okay, scripture says both. It's undeniable. It's right there in the same sentence. It says both God's sovereignty, human responsibility. There they are. So yes. clarity there, but then confusion because it's saying both. <laughs> so how do we make yes. sense of it? But, uh, but, but yeah. So a lot of people or one of, one of the most famous responses to the problem of evil is the free will defense. Uh, people, in response to, to, to the question of well, how could God allow evil or why, why would God allow something like the, uh, like the, the, the New Zealand Christchurch mass mass shooter, um, you know, or any other example, why would God allow something like this in the world or any other example? And, and whereas your argument comes from the greater good, but moves on to the greater glory saying that God allows every instance of evil for his greater glory and his good purposes, uh, in glorifying himself and redeeming the world through all these things. Um, there's others who would argue the free will defense that says, well, uh, God doesn't step in to stop evil, to stop these instances that we see of extreme malevolence um, because he has a respect for free will. You're a, you're, you're somewhat of a, uh, of a critic of the free will defense. Can you share with us what, what is your critique of the free will defense and why you don't rely on it for your theodicy? Yeah, the free will defense, it's important to understand what, what those who espouse the free will defense, what they mean by free will. Um, it, it's typically associated with, with free will theists, which would include uh, theologians like Arminians, classic Classical Arminianism mm -hmm. would embrace this view of free will. Open theism uh, has the same view of free will as well as, uh, as a, a recently very popular um, uh, theology known as Molinism. Uh, mm -hmm. but, um, but anyway, the idea is that their definition of free will is, first of all, uh, you cannot be free if somehow your choices are determined by God. And so your choices cannot be in any way determined by God himself. So in that sense, free will is, is said to be indeterministic. In other words, it cannot be determined by anything outside of the person choosing himself. Okay, so there's an independence, if you will, uh, between humans and God. There's no direct connection between God determining, you know, like, like we just saw in, in, in Acts chapter two, God predetermined that these godless men would kill Christ. Right. So they have trouble. You have trouble answering that, that passage or dealing with that passage because you have to say, no, these godless people were not in any way predetermined. They freely made this choice uh, apart from any, uh, any determination on God's part. And then, so that's the one plank of this free, of, of what is known as libertarian free will. That, that's, that's a technical definition of it. Uh, and then that's the first plank of it, that it's indeterministic. It, it, it cannot be determined by God. Um, there's other things in there too. But, but the second plank is that you could have always chose otherwise, and you could have done so equally. So if you're standing at a fork in, in, in the road, you could have chosen A or B, and you could have done so equally. Uh, and, and so you're only free if your choices are undetermined and you have the ability to choose otherwise. Mm 
Um, and, and so those are the two planks of, of libertarian freedom. Uh, well, it's, it, it, and some have said, said that, that what is important about that is that in order for good to have any value, in, in, in other words, in order for you to have any value to your good choices or to have any kind of re- moral responsibility for those choices, you, c- you have to have had the equal ability to have chosen evil. Okay. And so, so when God created the world, he wanted to preserve this valuable thing called free will defined in those ways that I've just defined them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so in order for God to get any good out of this world, he has to risk that his creatures might choose evil. Okay. Um, And so, but there's lots of problems with that. And, and one of the main problems is, okay, well, does God have such free will? In other words, in order for God to achieve some good, must he have the equal ability to choose evil? Mm. Um, Well, of course not. We know that God has no ability to make an evil choice, right? And Mm -hmm. and so anything that God does must have some good and wise purpose flowing from his own all-wise and all-good character. Uh, and, and so it's not even possible that God could do evil. Uh, and yet, do we not praise him for all the good that he does? Well, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we don't, we don't uh, you know, we're not somehow feeling like God is constrained somehow because he can't choose evil. Uh, and, and so, uh, so if God doesn't have this valuable thing called free will then why is it so valuable supposedly for human beings if god doesn't have it Mm -hmm. and another way of looking at it is will will the redeemed have this free will in heaven Hmm. Um, in other words all of the good that we see connected with you know the eternal kingdom you know in the new heavens and new earth for the redeemed uh, will this still be some valuable thing for them? Uh, you know, well, of course not. So if it's not valuable in the eternal state, has no value whatsoever, then why is it somehow valuable in this corrupted world that we live in? Surely God could create conditions where evil was not a possibility. Hmm. Uh, and, and so, so, yeah, there's a whole host of problems with this free will uh, defense. Uh, another huge problem for the Christian, especially for our Arminians, is if God has foreknowledge of all future events, then is it possible that we can change God's previous knowledge of those events by our choices so that he couldn't know what we're going to choose. And if libertarian free will is true, then God couldn't know what our choices would be. Mm -hmm. Otherwise we wouldn't have the power to make an alternative choice. Cause if God already knows that you're going to wake up at nine Oh seven tomorrow morning, is it possible that you can fool God and wake up at nine 10, you know? Um, And so there's, there's a foreknowledge problem that, that this view has to, to grapple with. And so ultimately I don't think free will uh, is a good answer to the problem of evil. Um, And besides that, it, it doesn't really get to the heart of the issues because all free will theists believe that God does have the power to prevent or stop evil, but he doesn't supposedly to preserve their freedom, but we do know of instances where God does stop it. And so why doesn't he always stop it? Yeah. And and so they have difficulty answering those kinds of questions. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's for those same reasons that you, that you laid out that I've never found the free will defense to be very satisfying because it's, it's reasonable. It sounds, it sounds reasonable, at at least on the surface. Um, but then you you stop and so you, then you think about just 
specific examples of tragedy and malevolent malevolence in our world and say, well, really that's why, <laughs> Yeah, like you said, it, yeah. it's not very satisfying, not nearly as much as, uh, as, as the greater good or greater glory arguments. Well, let's talk about something or, or, well on the same subject, but shifting gears just a little bit from, you know, the very heady theological and philosophical issues to talking about this, what is the Christian's responsibility in light of everything we've been talking about? What is the Christian's responsibility in light of evil and suffering in our world? Well, um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think when, you're, when your theology is focused on the, the supremacy of the God, that we believe in um, and that everything is done for his glory and that everything that unfolds in this world is not ultimately pointless or senseless or gratuitous, even though we may look at certain evils that take place in this world, we look at something like the Holocaust and we say, this is senseless evil. This is pointless. What purpose could possibly, good purpose could possibly come from this? And we don't know. We don't know all the answers to that question. Uh, I believe I provided a broad answer to that question. And I think the Holocaust really, um, you know, it, you know, is a picture of the depths of evil and depravity and the, and the darkness uh, to which the crisis of evil has taken the world. Uh, and I think through that, Christ's glory is even more magnified because of the depth of such evils like that and his defeat of death and his judgment of evil and so forth. Uh, but the point is, is that we may not always understand in our own personal situations or in the situations of people that we deal with, um, you know, how God is working or, you know, uh, what his purposes are, but we can cling to the reality that God does have some all wise and good purpose for the evil and the suffering that we go through, especially as believers. Um, we have a, a man in our church right now who is, um, who is suffering from uh, COVID. He's, he's in his forties. He's a doctor and, um, and uh, he's hanging, his, his life is hanging by a thread right now. He's on a ventilator and uh, things do not look good for him. Um, he's got a, a wonderful young wife and two young children. And, you know, our church, people our church are asking why what is going on why why this you know uh, in some sense you can understand somebody who's older who has comorbidities and that sort of thing mm -hmm. you know dying of covid uh but why why this young person with young children and so much going for him and so much life ahead of him we can't answer those kinds of questions but what we can answer, what we can cling to is that we know that God is good. We know that he is all good and that he causes all things, as Romans 8.28 tells us. He causes all things, not just the good things, but even the things from our perspective that are evil. Um, he causes both the good and the bad, the good and the evil to work together for good. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And um, I don't understand everything that's going on in our world right now. And I don't understand all the pain and suffering that, that we have to face um, in terms of specific reasons for why this specific evil has occurred. But I do know this. I do know that in the face of that, the one thing that I can cling to is my God, because he is all wise, he is all good, and he is all sovereign. And if he is not any of those things, 
then what hope do I have? Yeah. Where am I going to turn? There is no other place that I could turn. And it doesn't make sense out of everything, but it does bring peace and comfort to my heart to know that I have a God who knows what he's doing yeah, and has a good and wise purpose for all that, that transpires, even though I may not understand it. I, I think Christians don't get it. A lot of times they don't get that reality and they have not immersed themselves in the wonder and the glory of who God is. And it's not always an easy, you know, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, right? He didn't say that we're going to have a trouble-free life as Christians. He goes, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He isn't offering a, a full-blown theodicy there, but I think he is hinting at the fact that he's got this thing under control. He's got a purpose. He's got a plan, and we have to trust him. Um, and, and nothing drives us to trust Christ more than when we face great tragedy and evil. And it's precisely uh, the thing that God wants us to do. When we come into those situations, he is driving us to cling to him all the more tighter. Mm -hmm. And that's the hope we need to give to a world that, that is cast into the throes of, of pain and suffering. Yeah. Um, it's the hope of the gospel. That's really what it is. And, and that gospel is rooted in the perfections of, of an unfathomably amazing and glorious God. And um, that's where our hope lies. And that's where, that's where all these questions need to be anchored mm -hmm. in that reality for the believer. Yeah, one of my mottos in life and something that I see on the podcast fairly often and in other writings is hold fast to the anchor. You know, mm. the, the Christ is our anchor in every storm. As, as Hebrews says, he's the anchor of our hope. And, uh, and, and so our our responsibility in life in, in the face of suffering, chaos, and tragedy is to hold fast to the anchor and to, yeah, it's and to weather the storm. It's interesting you should use that word anchor. I, I, I heard somebody say the other day, and it was in a sermon, I assumed that it was based on, on genuine research, because I never heard this before, but, but, but he had said that in the ancient catacombs, you know, where the Christians escaped suffering from the Romans and whatnot uh, in the first, first century, that um, the most common symbol that was found in those catacombs was not a cross, but an anchor mm. and, and the, the, the image being exactly what we're saying that in the face of pain and suffering in the face of persecution, their anchor was Christ. And, and so they use that image of, of an anchor, you know, when you're being tossed to and fro upon the waves of, of pain and suffering and persecution and evil that afflicts us every day. Our anchor is Christ, and we hold firm to that anchor. And, yeah. and I think it's a it's an amazing reminder of of where our focus needs to be. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a great place to start to tie a knot on this conversation. We could go into so many other issues and nuances of this topic, uh, but I think there's no better place to to find our conclusion than, like you're saying, in the gospel and in uh, the person of Christ. Before we go, can you tell us uh, how, if people are interested in uh, connecting with you, following you, um, and, and so on, can you tell people how to find you? Yeah, uh, I'm on Twitter and Facebook. Um, uh, I, gosh, I can't remember my handle. I, I think my handle on Twitter is at uh, Pastor Scott C. Um, and then uh, Facebook, you can just look up Scott Christensen. You should be able to find me uh, there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, those are the, those would be the main places to find me. Or you can check out our our church website, which is uh, Uh, uh 
people can look there and find some messages that I've done. So we do some, we do a pastor's podcast there that you can find those podcasts on that website. And, uh, but that'd be the best place. Great. Awesome. And then your book, what about evil? Uh, newest book is available uh, everywhere books are sold. They're, it's available on Amazon. Right. And so uh, if people enjoyed this conversation, I'd highly recommend them to uh, go and, and get your book and, and read it and dig in even more. Uh, it'll certainly be, be worth their time. Well, Scott, I want to thank you a lot uh, once again for joining us today. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I'm sure that all of our listeners really enjoyed it as well. So thank you for joining us on Filter. My pleasure. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, aaronchamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast to the end.